What's up, John? You hang tight. So, I've decided to do something a little different today. And um, so, here we go. This is the way any proper Brooklynite should be greeted. What's up? Hi. Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah, nice. I figured if we're bringing you one of you from Brooklyn, it has to be done <laughs> this way. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's so, great. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, what'd you do this weekend? Uh, a lot of laundry. <laughs> um, you got a couple of kids, right? Yeah, I went for a I went for a run on Saturday. It was nice. Okay. Get outside. All right. Uh, did a little gardening. Did a little gardening with my wife. So, uh, do do you grow? Do Are we, you just what? clean? What, what do you grow? Oh, uh, you know, just like some flowers and stuff. Okay, so no food. No, or like you know, herbs for the garden. All right. All right. Okay, um, so no, uh, all the uh, if you want to do food, um, like in like around Fort Greene, you have to build uh, separate beds uh, because of like all back when the Navy Yard was the Navy Yard, um, lots of pollutants got into the soil, so all the soil around here tests uh, positive for lead. Oh, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, so, all right. Before we start, we'd like to ask the people in uh, who is tuning in. Tell us where you are from throughout the world. What's up, Catherine Ceramics? Let's say hello to people coming in. Um, hey, hi, Catherine. Angela Stuckey. Uh, Christina Lena. Uh, demand, demand, demand. <laughs> um, um, of Earth, what's up? So, I have a couple of questions we're going to start with. Yeah. Um, and if the those watching care to participate, you can just write in your answers to the questions. Your favorite subject in high school? Mine? Yes, yours. Um, I don't know, math, math maybe? All right, okay. Um, favorite food? Now? Yeah. Or in high school? <laughs> now. <laughs> um, I don't know, I like, you know, I like a lot of food. Um, uh, pasta carbonara. All right, your uh, favorite band? Uh, TV on the radio. Okay. What kind of music is that? It's rock. Okay. All right. Yeah. They used to, all those guys used to be from Brooklyn, like in the early 90s. Okay. Mid 90s. And then they all like moved to LA. Okay. All right. Um, favorite movie? Oh, boy. I don't know. You know, we did. We just re, we just rewatched. Um, this isn't like my favorite favorite, but we we just rewatched um, Casablanca the other night, and that still uh, really held up pretty well. Okay. All right. Cool. So, um, uh, David Duyard, what's up? Dominique Mercado, hello. Uncle Yanko. Um, so, bike or car? Wait. Sorry. What? Bike or car? Oh, bike. Pepperoni or cheese? Oh, uh, cheese. Beer wine. Mm. 
Beer. Do you not drink? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I, mean, you didn't, uh, I mean, I would say gin otherwise. I mean, you can <laughs> um, throw, throw a few other options in there. Th that's true. Bottle water or tap water? Tap. All right. I, I do tap too. New York. I know. I do tap too. Closer to your mom and dad. Uh, not super close. Okay. Um, how many siblings? One. One brother. Okay. Young, younger. Um, all right. Have you ever oh. slept outside overnight sober? Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> have you ever been too drunk to get home? Um, no. All right. Okay. All right. So... Here we are. Yeah. Um, tell us about you. Let's start from high school. Okay. Um, like all of high school or after post high school? Post high school. Like what, once you became an adult. Yeah, right. Um, I feel like that's still kind of a work in progress. Um, <laughs> so uh, post high school, um, Went to a small year, a small uh, two-year liberal liberal arts college in Minnesota. What's the name uh, of it? It's called Be it, It's called uh, Bethany Lutheran College. Okay. It's in Mankato, Minnesota. Um, okay. Mankato is famous for being like the home of Laura Ingalls Wilder, Little House on the Prairie, author. Right. <laughs> um, so. I did that. So I was there for two years. Um, and at the time, it was just a two-year college. So after that, I went to, uh, I was from Madison, Wisconsin. So I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, what did you study? Like, at that point, I was, I was in the art department. Okay. So I have, a, right. B, I have a BFA from Madison. Right. Um, so were you, were you doing any kind of art at that time? I, I mean, I was doing things that I thought were art. And, and what were they? You know, um, the, so the, the small college that I went to, they didn't really have a sculpture department, but they had a, they had ceramics, but I wasn't really interested in ceramics as a end to anything. So I was kind of doing really bad, uh, really bad figurative sculpture, um, I was doing a uh, painting because I had a painting program. Um, I was doing drawing. And then when I got to Madison, um, I really, there was one prof I really liked to uh, was kind of in charge of the sculpture department. So I really focused on sculpture then. Okay. And at that, at that time, um, I was in, I was kind of into uh, like, kind of weird combinations of materials. It was kind what of- kind, What kind of materials? Um, I did a lot of uh, kind of like dumpster diving. So there'd be like reclaimed wood combined with like concrete and, you know, styrofoam and stuff. Kind of pr like, you're pretty, like really pretty forgettable, um, you know, undergraduate type artwork. But, but that's where you were. So all oh, that's a part of your journey. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you know what not to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so I did that, and then uh, I graduated from Madison, and then um, I and I sort of had to sort of had to move out of where I was living, um, and some friends of mine from school were moving to New York, and so I was like, okay, moving to New York. Just like that. Uh, fair, pretty, pretty close to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, got to New York, worked a series of, you know, not great jobs. Like what? Uh, there were like, for, for whatever reason, when I got to New York, like that whole like make your own necklace bead stringing thing was like, all this, people were like, "Oh my God! Wow, this is so cool!" So I worked in a I worked in a couple of I worked in a couple of bead stores. 
Are you going? Are you going to bring that back? <laughs> me no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, and then um, eventually, kind of through some uh, connections to Madison, there's a. It still exists. There's this place called Dudenay Paper Mill that made uh, handmade paper. It had been wow. started. It had been started in like the late seventies by two Madison grads who moved to New York. Um, and so I worked for them kind of, they had like this little store at a little gallery. Um, and I kind of worked for them running the store and writing press releases and hanging shows in the gallery. So did you learn to make paper? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in theory, I mean, you know, like, like everything, people who really make paper are like master paper makers. It's, it's, yeah. you know, but yeah, I mean, I like, the general outline. That's why it was interesting when you were talking to um, Black Box. For, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alina. Yeah. Um. Because I was like, you know, there are very few people who are set up with capabilities to make like four by six foot sheets of paper. Um. But you can do it, and she could like she could. She seemed like somebody who's like, I'm going to do this. So she could probably easily figure out what to do if she wanted to. Right. Um, so in theory, I know how to do that. Yeah. And then um, it was a, like, it was a great job and that, you know, I was kind of in the art world. I really liked the people that I worked with uh, were lovely, but it was really kind of scraping by. Um, you know, like every month I would kind of ask my parents to, you know, for money to help make ends meet and, um, uh, and so I, w I was just kind of like, I just wasn't making enough money. And so at a certain point, um, I'd done this kind of cutesy mail order catalog for them. Um, and somebody was like, oh, you should, you're, you seem like you'd get an advertising. I was like, really? <laughs> um, and so uh, that was still that was still like when you look for a job, you'd go through like the classifieds in the New York times, you know, that like pour through classified ads, anything that was about advertising. Um, and just sending out these really random packets of stuff. It was like gallery press releases and the mail order catalog. And of course I had like no idea, but it was sort of like, once I got into it, I was sort of like, wow, that was really clueless. Um, but I would just like mail the mail, like cold mail them out to these places. And so, okay, so, so what were you mailing? What was it? Was this for this is for the places you worked? No, it was it was it, it, it was two places that were that said they had openings for advertising copywriters. Okay. Um, and one of them ended up being this random like woman who's a headhunter and she brought me in and she's like, um, hi, you don't know anything about advertising, but you seem like a pretty creative person. So you could probably like figure it out. And she's like, I, she specifically plays people in pharmaceutical advertising. And at that point I was like, okay, you know, whatever. I don't, I didn't really care. Right. Um, the bills. What? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so she was like, this is what you need to do. You should go home and make some ads. And once you've made some ads, call me up and I'll send you out on some interviews. And I was like, okay. So I made some really bad ads and she sent me out on like an interview. And the guy was kind of like, um, these are awful. You don't know anything about advertising. There's a, there's a class at SVA. You should take the copywriting class at SVA and then you'll kind of know what you're doing. Like, okay. So that summer I like worked a series of um, like kind of random pickup, you know, art moving jobs. Um, started taking the class at SBA. Sort of like, oh, this is how advertising is supposed to work. Um, and I kind of sat down and redid my round of ads. And kind of by the end of the summer, she the same woman like sent me sent me out to see the same guy who still hadn't hired anybody um and he was and he was kind of like okay these are there's these are still terrible but they're better than what 
initially brought. So he hired me. And <laughs> so that's, that's how I got into like pharmaceutical advertising, which I did for like the next 12 years. Okay. And then at a certain point, um, and you were able to pay your bills. I was able to pay my bills. Yeah, there was this great, um, there's this great cartoon that somebody had. Uh, this video editor had in their office of these guys, and they all had like this hole in the middle of them, and it was to the effect of like one guy was like, "Wow, I have this huge hole where my soul used to be." And the other guy's like, you won't miss it once it gets filled up with money. <laughs> so I was like, it was like, yeah. So you like, it was, it was like one of those weird industries where if you were like pretty good at it, you could, you could make a, like a good living doing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's what the country was a little while ago. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, so I did that for a while uh, and really didn't enjoy it. Um, and then, so, so then at a certain point, like, I guess about six years ago, um, as a Christmas present, my wife gave me a gift certificate for a class at Greenwich House Pottery, which, ten years ago. or maybe like 10 years ago. <clears throat> um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, which is, uh which is like one of the- I'm not gonna ask you how long you've been married. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, she like, it's good. Cause she like, somebody has to have a brain, right? Um, which is like one of the oldest, like uh, studio, pottery studios in the country. Um, and you can go there, they have classes, they have members and through classes, you can go like work up in studio. So I, I, it was sort of a, here's a creative outlet for you to do something. They started doing that um, and really like enjoyed it. But it was a very like, it was a one night a week thing. That was like all the time I had to do it. How, how many hours? Three hours. Three, Three hours, hours for how many weeks? I don't, I don't know, six, eight maybe. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so, right. So I started doing it and I kind of was trying to figure out a way to make something that was nice. Um, it was a hand building class and I just didn't have the time to like really learn ceramics. So, um, I figured out a way to use like regular household dishes as press molds. So basically you roll out your clay in a slab of clay um, and like press it into something else and it kind of sets up and then you, you stick all these pieces together. And I, I was sort of like, wow, that looks like a real thing. I just made a base. Um, and so that was kind of my way into making things. And then it kind of eventually, um, uh, more people. What was the first thing you made? A real, like a really, in that class, like a really- A skillet? A what? A, in, in your house, the, the household things that you would, would use as, as a mold. Oh, the first thing, um, I don't know, but like bowls were good. So they're like okay. round and you can, um, and then, so then eventually uh, my wife and I kind of traded off. She'd started a, what do you mean? Uh, well, so she was she she came out of art the art the arts. Nonprofit. Your wife was in the arts. She ran. She ran. Um. Yeah. She ran. Uh. This not like an arts. It was kind of like a, a summer residency program. Okay. Um. But she eventually just kind of got got tired of that and wanted to do something. She was looking to do something more. Than but still kind of in the nonprofit world. So she started her own nonprofit. It's called the Sadie Nash Leadership Project. And it was about, um, it was kind of like educational, this educational program for um, low income girls in Brooklyn, it started out in Brooklyn. And the whole idea, the whole idea was kind of- Kudos uh, to her. Yeah. So her whole, 
her whole thinking was that when you look at models of leadership out in the world, right, it's predominantly white men. And so she was like, if you're a woman, you don't have, you don't really have a model for leadership because everything you see. If you're anything other than white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, this is it. So the program was a summer program and she would bring in all these different women doing lots of different things. It wasn't just like, hi, I happen to be, you know, the female council member from Brooklyn. But it was to show them there, there are, there's this whole array of different ways for you to, lead, to be a leader in life. Um, and so she did that for about 10 years. And then one of her, the funders of, um, of her organization was something called the Brooklyn Community Foundation. The Brooklyn Community Foundation basically raises money in Brooklyn um, to distribute to Brooklyn nonprofits. So they were, they were kind of at this like inflection point of, um, they'd started out as a bank foundation and then the bank got sold and they were like, what are we gonna do with this foundation? So they became a community foundation. Um, and they were at this point where they were kind of trying to figure out who they were and they were looking for a new exec, uh, president and CEO. Um, and she eventually was hired. And so she was like, if I am now taking on like this big job, you're quitting advertising because you're making yourself and everyone else in the family miserable and you're going to go do humble matter stuff. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. And so for about... Talk, talk, about, talk about leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Um, no, my, my wife is definitely like, a very, she's a very impressive person. She's amazing. Um, and, <laughs> and then, so for about two years, I sort of did uh, freelance advertising part-time and Humble Matter part-time. And then finally, I was just sort of like, I'm either going to kind of just do this and try to make it work or not. And so... For the last like two and a half, this was 2020 was going to be the third, you know, full year of full time humble matter. Um, so yeah. So okay, so <clears throat> while you were doing both, what was that like? <laughs> um, Let's say hello to a couple of people. Yeah. Amo Ceramics, hello. First Hi. Last, hello. Deportel, hello. Monitor Millwork, hello. Betsy Edwards, hello. Andrew Roy, hello. Um, Pili Gomez Gomez Soro, hello. Um, Art and Design Online, hello. Um, Sarah Gonzola, hello. Uh, Camille Ellen, hello. All right, so go ahead. So you're doing both. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a lot. It was like a lot of running. How, 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 how long did it take you to develop a style? Um, a form that you were comfortable with? I mean, kind of, so after the, kind of the, like the second round of um, classes at Greenwich House. So how, how many, how many times did you go to um, take classes? So the, so the way it works is if you're a, if you're a student there, you go to your, you go to one of your classes during the week, and then um, you can go to as much open studio time as you want to. So that's wow. how you get to do stuff there. So okay. you like if you're people, I mean, there are people there who are like probably master potters at this point, but that's what they work out of. So they they're in, they keep just registering for classes just so they can use the studios and stuff. Okay. Um, so I took classes there for like, I don't know, four, three, three years. Three years. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it was, kind of my, it was like my studio. I mean, that's where I was working at. So, so there are that many different levels or do you just do what you just said where you just sign up for the class and you just go do your I thing? think it, you know, it depends, it depends on you as a person. So, um, I don't, they don't really have, uh, I think it de and it all kind of depends on the teachers. Like some teachers, ha like have their classes. Like the guy I eventually ended up working with, like he had the same people in his class every time. 
and it was a lot of people who were in the arts and it wasn't really like instructional. Like he would, every once in a while, he'd do a demo on something, but we were, everybody in there kind of knew what they were doing and we were just like making our stuff. And there was- Oh, people, gotcha. Yeah, and there were some people who'd be like, it, you know, it'd be really funny. They'd be like, they'd ask the same question like every couple of weeks and he'd be like, I, what, what? I've, we've been over this. Um, or somebody, you know, somebody would say something like, what do you think of this form? And he was, he's, he was like, you know, this is, I'm not here to make your aesthetic decisions for you. He's like, what do you think of this form? Um, so, so, so would people like, help each other? Yeah. But other people had differently structured classes. Like some people had classes where they what would go they would go through the set of things that they taught, right? Um, or uh, you know, so it was kind of like if you found if you you know you kind of look around at the teachers and what they were teaching, and find somebody who you kind of vibed with, and you would try to get in their class and stay in their class. I think is. Is the sort of general strategy around working there, All right? And and you so did yeah. this for three. You did this for three years. So I worked there for like three years, and eventually, um, it just didn't work out with my per, like my personal schedule. All the open studio stuff is like in the afternoon. My kids were getting home from school in the afternoon, so I wanted to be at, be home. And I was just kind of like, this isn't this just isn't a good fit for my excuse me, my life. So were you, were you selling, were you selling stuff at this time? Uh, yes. Minimally, like at one store in New York. All right. Okay. Um, and then, so after that, I switched to this place called um, Brick House Ceramic Arts Center. That's in um, Long Island City, Queens. Uh, that was much more of, that was just a studio. Like they had classes, but they also had, you could just go in and work without anything. Just do your thing. Um, and I like that because it was a straight shot. My house is really close to the G train. It was a straight shot from my house to like two blocks from there. Um, so I did that, I think for about two years. And then. Um, so how many days a week would you go? I go every day. Every day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and then, then at a certain point, I was kind of, I kind of felt like I needed to, I could either kind of keep doing what I was doing, but I was always sort of behind. Um, and I wanted to hire somebody and they weren't really set up for that. I was like, could I, you know, what if I paid their rent, could they come in and work with me? And they were sort of like, that's not really what we're set up to do. And I was like, that's cool. So, so um, you were busy? Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. so you're selling stuff now? Yeah, yeah. And, and what would you need a helper for? Um, to, like, they, they make pieces. OK, to, to help you? Yeah. Yeah. So were you looking for just another budding ceramist or were you looking for just labor? So what, what the way it, what happened was um, we had, uh, <laughs> this is, so we had, um, we had this woman who's a, who babysat our kids, uh, who'd gone to Pratt um, and was like, could kind of do anything. She was really like amazing. She like had a degree in architecture from Pratt. She was a designer. For she was like a pretty serious rock musician. Um, she could sort of do anything. And so at a certain point, we didn't need a full-time babysitter anymore, but I still, but I still needed Keep somebody. on the team. Yeah, I still needed somebody to pick my son up from soccer practice two days a week. And I, so I was really, I didn't want her to be like, hey, it's not worth my while to just pick your son up two days a week because whatever. So I asked her, I was like, you know, would you want to um, kind of work with me? And so she would, 
she was she's really one of the sweetest people ever she would come and work in my basement and so she would kind of be making things in my basement that i would then like take in my car and take over to queens along with the stuff that i made in queens to like buy it but so it started out as she would just kind of parts of things then i'd put everything together but then it got to the point where she would she was like making stuff so, so my my philosophy has always been I'm not there's nothing that I'm doing that's like above like really a fifth grade ceramics level like I'm not you know what I'm saying like I would never count myself as like any kind of um I, I just feel like if you are like if you understand the material and you're patient I feel like a lot of people they get tripped up on like I wanted to get it all done, and then it sort of like fell apart. And it's like, well, it fell apart because you what you're doing. So, like the things I do are like very, you know, it's very kind of systematic. It's just, it's kind of like what I said. You make a thing, you attach it to another thing, you take another apart, you attach it to that, you kind of smooth it all together, and voila, there's your there's your ceramic thing. Um, and she was so, like, precise. It was great. So I, I just was like, I wanted to not be working in my basement. Um, and so I started looking for, like, another, like, group studio. How, how, I, how, big, was the, how big is the basement? Uh, it's big. I mean, it's big. It's I mean, I'm, so I've, been work, I've been working down there during quarantine. I mean, it's a very low ceiling. It's like a, you know, it's like a six and a half foot ceiling, but there's a lot of space. So why not use it? Um, there's not a lot of light. It's just, I mean, I, I mean, I have been using it. It's just not, it's just not optimal. Ideal. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. okay, let me say, when, when, when we first started, I was in a building with other woodworkers. Yeah. And I left that building. I went to another building with woodworkers. Mm -hmm. And I, because of me always having old, big equipment, a lot of guys would stop by just to look at the machines. Mm -hmm. And when their friends would come over, they would say, hey, let's go check out this guy. I want you to show you this guy's shop. They will bring their friends up to look at the machines. So yeah. I would always have people stopping in. Mm -hmm. So if I ever ran into a problem, someone was either on the way or they were there. <laughs> nice. So I would be That's like, awesome. hey, yeah. And, and when I moved to where I am now due to the fire, Mm -hmm. No one comes to see me because I'm far away and I'm in I'm in a residential area. Oh, you're in a residential area. Yeah, yeah. It's a commercial building in a residential area. You know, it's grandfather. They used to make ships here and roll them out to the Hudson River. I'm literally uh, directly across from the last Domino um, operating Domino sugar plant. Oh, okay. So I I and I, I was going that way because I was wondering if that was um, a factor in you staying, not staying in your, in your basement, because it seems like that'd be cheaper, especially if there's a lot of space. But if there's um, a certain energy you get from being where you are, then you need that to create. Yeah, I mean, th I mean there are some other logistical things. I don't have a kiln. Um, I, how hot I mean, does your kiln need to be? How what? How hot does it need to be? Um, I think it, fire, it fires up to about 2,700 degrees. That's hot. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, le they're ju it's just they're, I mean, I've thought about getting one lately. I've been like, well, we're, I mean, you, you got to find some place to vent it. Um, they're just like some logistical issues and also I'm not as I said I'm not really a ceramicist and um, the thing I liked about 
so there are a couple, I mean, there are pros and cons to everything, right? So the nice thing about working out of a group studio is that you're just, you're basically just paying for your table space there. Yeah. Um, and the studio takes care of all the other like stuff that isn't fun to take care of. Um, and then the other thing is it's really nice. It's really nice being around people. Yeah. No, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it, it, it has, it has advantages. Yeah, I mean, I think being a being an artist is solitary enough pursuit in and of itself that um, I, I like have like, and often there are not other people there, which is you know, which is also nice. You have this space yourself. Um, but even you know, the the woman who owns it will often come down and hang out for a while. And it's just like, it's really nice to have. I think that sense of community. So yeah. that that's like one of the. That's always kind of been one of my main uh, motivating things. Like one of the things I actually liked about working in advertising is I really liked all the people that I worked with. Um, and I liked the sense of being on a team and getting, getting feedback from other people. Um, I really think that collaboration uh, is a, is a great thing. And um, and I think that's the way, you know, that's the way you grow as a person you know, getting feedback from other people and hearing what they have to say and, you know, exchange of ideas. Um, I think that's, you know, that's it's one yeah. of those things that's like, like just integral to growth. Growth. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. So you're selling stuff at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And when did you at what point did you decide okay this is this is good when, when did you get the name when did you come up with the name oh i mean i came up with the name like eat before i even started i was trying to come up with names for something else um what else other, what what else it's just like other other side projects i, I was trying to um really wanted to start like this t-shirt company. Um, and so Printing I was- or designing? Uh, no, just designing. Okay. Um, and it come How up with go? a book. It never got off the ground. Uh, there was this guy, it... cat, like, I mean, I'm not an art, I, I was trying to get this friend of mine who's an art director. It was gonna be mainly like, um, Type. It was going to be mainly like kind of type-based designs, um, and I was trying to get this friend of mine who is an art director interested in in working on it with me. Um, he's a really good designer and a creative guy, and I was like, "This will be great. We can do this." And he was kind of like, "I don't want to do that." I was like, "Why not?" <laughs> um, so it didn't. So it didn't happen. Um, but anyway, Humble Matter was one of the names that was like left up, left over from that. And then when I decided to do this, I was like, that's a great name. It kind of, it connects to Clay. I like the fact that both of the, both words had the same number of letters in it. I thought that was like a good, good from a layout alignment, whatever thing. Um, and so it was just like one of those things where I was like, oh, that's like, that's a good fit. But I had that like from the beat, like, whenever this kind of started since 2014 okay so okay now at what point did you know that you were on something um so Gre so greenwich house does as, as a lot of like group studios do um throughout new york they do an annual holiday sale where they kind of clean everything up and people get to like set up at tables and you sell like, it's a number, um, and you sell your work and they take like, I don't know, 20% or something, uh, goes to support Greenwich house and you keep the rest. Um, and so the first, so I was like, uh, I'm going to do the holiday thing. Um, and so I did that. And I made a bunch of stuff and I sold like almost everything. Wow. Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, people were like, wow, your work is pretty cheap. I was like, oh, but, <laughs> but it was still, 
Um, but it was still really nice. I mean, it was kind of an amazing feeling. And so that was kind of, that was kind of the thing where I was like, okay, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing this in a vacuum and people seem to be responding positively. That was so, the first. So after that, what did you do? Um, I, you know, I'll be honest, not like not a whole lot. I have uh, my phone is kind of dying. Um, I don't okay. I haven't tuned into like all, all of your interviews, but like all the people that you interviewed, like I feel like I'm kind of the worst case study in how to start a business um, because I haven't really done anything. Well, and I, and um, listen, listen, it's. Every every story is information, right? Yeah. And, well, yeah. And 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 along along the way, you figure out how things are done, um, and how people got to where they are. Yeah. I mean, so far, your wife has been great. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. No. I, I mean. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's a testament to having uh, a partner who is very supportive of you know of yep. your efforts. So basically, so basically, what I did was um, at this point, I was still still kind of half doing advertising. Um, I just, I just honestly, I just posted a lot of stuff on Instagram. Um, and, and after a while figured out that you needed to, like, if you wanted to people uh, to actually see what you're posting, you need to use hashtags. And so, so you, uh, so you learned how to use Instagram. <laughs> I learned how to use Instagram and I just, I just like posted the work and that's kind of been what I've done. So, and it picked up from that. You, you started to get clients. Started to get some clients. Um, People, I was in, um, there was this thing called Brooklyn Clay Tour. Uh, I was in a show in that, and um, this woman who uh, now owns a, the, a gallery that I show at in New York, like, somehow found, a, found, a, <clears throat> found out about it, saw the pieces I had there, got, like, super excited, and was like, I want to sell your work, I want to sell your work. I was like, okay, I'm like, I mean, at that point, I was not, I was saying yes to everybody, because there was, it was like three people who were like, I want to sell your work. Um, and she's, she's been amazing. Uh, she's been a really great, uh, very supportive, real champion of what I've, what I've done. Um, and I would, so I would say that she's like another, uh, one of the big reasons for my success. Like she was so she to... What? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, she like the, she was really willing to kind of, uh, kind of put me out there as like more of an artist and um, was like, I'm gonna, you know, she's like, I'm gonna sell your pieces for as much as I can possibly sell them for. I was like, um, okay, great. I mean, great. Who's going to say Let no to that? Let the lady do a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so that, <clears throat> so that's kind of been, that's been that. And, you know. So, um, okay, so let, let's talk about that. Yeah. When, when because she, she obviously saw something in you that you didn't see. So when she took your work and she started selling it, were you surprised at how much? Yeah. She was able to get for it? Yeah. Right. It was it's like, it was like, it was kind of like, wow, that's crazy. And at, at, at a certain Wait, point. Let me, let me ask you, did you run home and tell your wife? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I did. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, and at a certain point, she, like, there was this crazy um, French designer who would buy from her. Like, this guy who, um, <laughs> I don't know what he's been doing now, 
but like up until last year, he'd like design, do interior design on these like multi million dollar yachts. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So she was like, all I have to do is sell a few pieces to that guy. And we're like, <laughs> minting money. Um, but I mean, people like him are, you know, I've discovered kind of few and far between. I mean, like everyone else, most interior designers are not just like, I don't care, I'll just pay whatever you're asking for it. Um, you know, they have budgets. Their clients don't want to spend like millions of dollars on whatever they're doing. Some of them um, want to make money on a deal because they don't on the other end. Yeah. All kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Okay, so she starts to sell your work. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a little problem. Because if she's getting X for your work, and over here, you're not getting X for your work, what do you yes. do? Um, I don't know. You annoy a lot of people by constantly changing your prices. Um, eventually, you know, you kind of like even things out. Um, the other thing, the other thing that I've kind of tried to do as well is that um, try to do kind of like unique things for different people. Uh, um, so, you can, so people can't be like, oh, Bob is selling this for this and, you know, Janice is selling the same piece for $200 less. What's up with that? So I've tried to do things where, you know, make unique pieces. Hello, for, Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, uh, make unique pieces for different vendors. So there's less, so there's less kind of, you know, no one can, so right, I guess more, if one can, more custom. Like, yeah, what the worth of something is. Right. Right. They say is whatever people want to pay for it. Or whatever. That, is exactly, that is exactly true, yes. Yeah, whatever people are willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so how long does the average piece take you to make? Um, so that used to be a, kind of a difficult question to answer because you're kind of working on like a bunch of things at the same time. Okay. Um, but in my uh, basement studio, um, it basically like I, I was working on something the other day, it, you know, it depends on how complicated the piece is. But I mean, I think if you just sit down and only work on one thing, uh -huh. it takes probably about eight hours. Okay. All right. Um, who inspires you as an artist? as a ceramist? Um, I mean, a lot, like, lot, lot, like lots of people. I, I feel like, um, just like, you know, you go outside, you walk down the street, you look at your surroundings, you notice things that are going on there. You're like, oh, that's kind of an interesting shape. But I mean, real like artist, artists, I mean, I'm a big fan of Brian Cousy. Um, uh, uh, there's a, this Italian designer, a Tori Sotsas. I'm a big fan of him. He was like the, one of the people who started the Memphis design movement. Um, I'm a big fan of his. Um, uh, of like non-ceramic artists. One of, my, one of my favorite artists is Jack Whitten. Um, I mean, like, you know, there are like endless, you know, lists of right, right. people. So yeah. what, what, what building do you think is the most interesting in Brooklyn? What building? Since you said that you, when you, you, you're, you're inspired by stuff that you see walking around. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that comes to mind? There's, not, there's nothing that really... Sticks out. Sticks out. I guess I'm, I'm more... I, I guess the things that I tend to notice more are like... Um, you know, they're like those white plastic um, barricades with the orange stripes on them that you can like fill up with water. And I, I like every time I'll like, and it doesn't matter how many times I see them. Every time I like go, go for a run or something and see them, I'm like, that's just like a really great shape. Like you could just take one of those things, fill it up with whatever, put a top on it and you've just created a great like designer 
table. You're done. Okay. All right. What What do you see as your biggest challenge? Um, I, my biggest challenge is landing on um, kind of deciding what I what it is I want to be doing. Like I was, li I was literally having a conversation with my wife two days ago. I was asking her advice about something. And she looked at me and she's like, you know what? I give advice to people every single day. She's like, you are impossible. She's like, I never know what it is you really want. So I can't really give you advice until you're really honest with me about what you want. And I feel like that has kind of always been my thing. Like I will be start working on something and be like, oh, this is, this is very interesting and exciting. And I'll kind of focus on that. And then something else will pop up and I'll be like, oh, maybe I should really be doing that instead. So I have a, I have a hard time, I have a hard time landing on what it is I think I'm doing. And I think like from a business perspective, the same thing holds true. Like I don't feel like I'm kind of, you know, halfway in between, am I trying to make art? Am I trying to be more of like a more functionally based studio where I'm like making more pieces? Um, and I still, I don't have really have a good. Why can't you do both? Um, I, I guess, excuse me. Um, I guess you, I guess you could. I think some people do. I don't, I don't know. Um, when you say functional stuff, like you want to make plates, cups? No, I, no. I, I feel like um, there are lots of other... I, I mean, I, people who do that are great. And uh, there are so many other people who are... That's what they're passionate about doing. And they're doing it beautifully. That you don't need somebody who um, is sort of one fourth invested in doing something like that um, to then sit down and be like, okay, now I'm going to make some plates. I mean, I might do, there's, there's one woman who um, uh, sells a bunch of my work and she was like, I re she's like, I need you to make some plates for me. And I was kind of like, mm, for her personally, it's like, that's not really my thing, but uh, you know, okay. It's like a one time kind of interesting challenge thing. I would do that. But as an ongoing thing, that would have to be, um, it would have to be something where I'd be like, okay, here's the thing we're making. And I would just have somebody there who's just like making those. And it, it. it would be like that. Um, okay. I don't know. I think there are people who do that, who do that pretty successfully. I don't, I just haven't gotten to that point. Right. What are there any other materials in your radar that you are curious about working with or combining with clay? Yeah, I mean, um, right before uh, COVID hit, I was do I was taking a glass casting class at um, Urban Glass, which is in Brooklyn, um, which was which was cool. I've done, I've done, I'm, I have like this never ending lamp project that I think I'm on year three now of trying to finish. Um, so that include, that has a glass component included. Um, I actually did like some bronze casting in college. I always think it'd be like interesting to go back and maybe do something in cast bronze. I mean, I, you know, it's like one of those things where I try to be, um, I try to be kind of cognizant of like the amount of time I have um, and also, uh, you know, what it, what it is I'm doing. I feel like we've, we've kind of reached the stage where you, like almost anybody can make almost anything out of almost anything. Um, and so the, like certain, like, I feel like the, the, cha like kind of the challenges pe we face now as designers or builders or makers or, or whatever is not like 
can I, you know, can I bring this thing into the world? I just, I just try to be thoughtful about like, should I be making this thing? Like, does the world need another one of X, Y, or Z? And I try not to have it be like debilitating because at a certain point you're like, well, no, I, no one ever needs to probably make another cup ever. Sorry, you don't, right? No, I, I, I'm, I'm, but, let me, let me. Let me let wait, me, I just wanna, wait, just a second. Ahead. So, I, right. so, but clearly, you know, that doing that brings people a lot of joy and satisfaction and adds meaning to their lives, right? So I try not to tip over that far into the abyss of, I'm gonna stop doing anything whatsoever, but I do try to be thoughtful in terms of, you know, the things that I make. So what about innovation, right? What, what if, let, okay, let's say for example, you said, oh, the last thing we need is another cup. But what if mm -hmm. you start to make a cup and in the process, your cup in some way becomes different or better than other cups? Maybe, I, you know, I think innovation is like one of those interesting ideas. Um, I guess it depends on how you're defining innovation. Um, and I think it also, you know, the practice of ceramics, just to take ceramics, right? Hasn't materially changed for thousands of years. Right. Um, which isn't to say stop doing ceramics. Um, I just feel like the, pe when people use the word innovation, it's not used maybe with as much specificity as it should be. I feel like, you know, it's like one of those wor words like genius or something where, you know, like people say it. But when you really, when you really sit down and think about it and, and, put some parameters around what these words mean. A lot of what happens under the title of genius or innovation is neither genius nor innovative. Okay. And I think that um, one of the, a, a couple of years ago when I was still working in advertising, um, uh, uh, one of our friends and neighbors gave me this book. It was called Cradle to Cradle. Um, and it was this whole design philosophy, um, basically like coming out of the industrial revolution, it was like cradle to grave, like things were built, they had a life cycle and then they became useless. And um, the idea of cradle to cradle around design was this guy, I forget what his name is, but his philosophy was like, we've, it's, t it's also tied in environmentally, but he's like, we've reached a point in terms of the design and making of things. He's like, where we can no longer consider the life cycle of something as going from cradle to grave. And so he was calling it cradle to cradle. He's like, if you, to be a responsible designer today, you need to have figured out what is gonna happen to the thing that you're making after somebody stops using it. It cannot simply just become another piece of the landfill. Yes, I said, and, yeah, classic. Yeah. And so I feel like that, like, but, and yet, right. And yet, I mean, it's been, I don't know how many years since that book was published, 20 probably at this point. And yet we're still like, we have, no one has really solved that. Like there was, I remember there was a time right. when people like, that was like this huge thing. And, you know, we got, that was a big we got thing. 60 seconds. Yeah. Oh, okay. But anyway, so. So anyway, I guess what where, what I'm saying to go back to your like your question about materials is I just want to be thoughtful. Like, yeah, I could make a bunch of stuff out of glass, which luckily glass you can kind of melt down and redo. But I guess I don't want to be, you know, out there just like making stuff, just to like make stuff. You need a purpose. Yeah. A calling. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, so we got 28 seconds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you do great work. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks your story. For... Yeah. Um, and uh, we have another today at 6 p.m. Alabama Woodworker. All right. Cool. All right, brother.